Good afternoon, and welcome to the Partnerships for Environmental Public Health webinar entitled Reaching Our STEM Potential, How Can We Approve Our Performance in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. My name is Sharon Beard, and I'm an industrial hygienist at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences within the Worker Education and Training Program, and I will be the moderator for today's session. I am very pleased to introduce our speakers for the day, Dr. Ken, uh, Kathy Vandermeer, Massachusetts Institution of Technology, Dr. Dina Markowitz of the University of Rochester, and Dr. Mercy Aranda of NIEHS. The first presentation will be given by Kathy. Kathy earned her PhD in 1982 from the Tufts University School of Medicine, Anatomy and Cellular Biology Department, and joined the research team at Optra Incorporated, an innovative optics instrument company in Massachusetts. In 1990, she shifted gears and obtained a master's in education from Harvard University's Graduate School uh, of Education with a Massachusetts teacher certificate at two levels one in general science, 5th through ninth grade, and biology, 9th through 12th. Kathy taught science in Lexington, Massachusetts, public schools for 16 years. There she began to develop her popular Lego life science technical models, uh, and she incorporated them into MIT STEM outreach programs when she began the outreach director for MIT Center for Environmental Health Sciences. Kathy is the 2009 recipient of the Educator of the Year Award from the Massachusetts Association of Science Teachers, and she also received a 2011 Public Service Award from the People Making a Difference for her curriculum development work with the Boston Public Schools. In November 2011, she was inducted into the Massachusetts Science Educators Hall of Fame. Kathy, the floor is yours. Hello, this is Kathy Vanderbilt. I'm glad you were able to join us today, and I'm going to begin with a little bit of background about the two centers I work for. I work for the MIT Center for the Environmental Health Sciences and also the MIT Edgerton Center. Just as a quick note, uh, MIT has about 20, no, actually 30 to 40 uh, outreach programs. The MIT Edgerton Center hosts about 3,000 students per year on half-day field trips on the MIT campus. And I'm providing this website in case you'd like to look at some other uh, programs that we offer. The website will be uh, updated at the end of August, so I provided both views for you here. We have curriculum packages also posted online with teacher guides and student materials, and these are at a website called Mind in Hand the motto of MIT, and also uh, showing these two screen views. And this down here, the atoms and molecules set, is the one I will be talking further about today. Just as a point, at the Edgerton Center, we focus on key concepts that teachers find difficult to teach. And one of them is the atomic nature of matter, which now actually has been suggested as one of the six cross-cutting concepts in the next generation standards. Um, as a middle school teacher, I know that you'll recognize these uh, topics here. We teach a lot of introductory work in chemistry about chemical reactions, also introduce them when we talk about photosynthesis, and then when we're talking about air and weather, there are lots of things that have to do with molecules that need to be explained. So this is why we focus on the atomic nature of matter, because we teach across all these subjects. I'd just like to point out that the Edgerton Center and the Center for Environmental Health Sciences has uh, shared uh, these packages and uh, lessons at the Massachusetts Association of Science Teachers workshops, also at the um, Summer Institute in Texas, which we just came back from shortly, and uh, also uh, in Maine more recently, too. Okay, so how do most middle schoolers identify a chemical reaction? Here's a picture from the Edgerton Center, and the students are looking at a chemical reaction that's happening inside this bag. And it's extremely interesting. It's uh, changing temperature, color, the bag is blowing up. And in a few moments, they will be really um, more than fascinated. So students in the beginning first see that chemicals are reacting in a chemical reaction. And also, they associate chemical reactions with explosions, fizzing, color changes, you know it. So um, 
actually, uh, chemical reactions occur inside of you and all around you, not just in lab chemicals. And uh, so many times students are unable to apply this chemistry concept into other contexts, such as biology and earth science. And a lot more study has been done on that, so I just provided a reference below. In chemical reactions, the real point of the whole uh, process is to teach that uh, atoms get rearranged into different molecules with different properties, and that's their definition. But molecules and atoms are hard to, um, hard to visualize for students. One way in which we can talk about the new products is actually by showing them. This is what we do at the Edgerton Center in this particular lesson. We have calcium chloride in the bag as well as baking soda. And what's really interesting is we show the products, which include the gas that came off as CO2, uh, this precipitant here as chalk. You can see that the students here have uh, tested out the chalk. And here it is provided here. It's, it was a new product. And we can also identify by its new properties, these, uh, this NaCl, which now we can crystallize. So identifying the products is one of the things you can do. However, I think one of the really strong suits of the lesson now is that we uh, visualize the atoms in the reaction by using these inviting Lego bricks. Each brick represents an atom. And as you can see, these colors down the side are the standard CPK chemistry colors. And down here we have shown how these atoms can be snapped together as uh, bonded uh, atoms would be in a molecule. So CO2, water, and nitrogen as particular shapes. So it's very nice. The students can actually build those reactant molecules in their standard shapes, and they place them on this map. And uh, when they're built right, they fit just perfectly. So the students get that feedback of building them correctly. And then we can show with one flip of the map, students get to take the same atoms, they had the same bricks, and rearrange them into being these new products. And therefore, they get the reinforcement from doing it, from seeing it and actually doing it, that they make carbon dioxide, chalk, water, an extra molecule of water, and um, sodium chloride. This is really fun. I want to let you know that I taught this lesson, first of all, by using bricks to teach about photosynthesis. And, um, I typically have one or two kids in sixth grade that would literally pop out of their seats because they'd be so excited. They, they would yell, I get it, and it was just so much fun as a teacher. So I'd just like to point out what makes it a lot more fun also to teach about matter, atoms, elements, these definitions that one needs to be really clear about. You can do them by using the, these models, and this I'm showing on the screen is a graphic organizer that can be used for class notes. The red is actually teacher instructions, this is the key, and the blue is, is answers. I also like to mention that the kit management is really simple. Uh, kids work in teams of two, and they place their mats, this is the mat, sorry, they place their bricks on top of them in little stacks. They don't have to count them, and they really enjoy this very much. So you can see that uh, these bricks as atoms could be modeled uh, could be used as models for chemical reactions at many different times during middle school. And we have these lessons. So I've talked about the chemistry, chemical reactions one. We also use it in pho photosynthesis, where um, you can model the reaction of six water, six carbon dioxide, making a big, wonderful glucose molecule and having six oxygens left over. But it happens that um, Students can also take away, you know, they have to learn about parts of the cell. Well, at this point, if they have to learn about the functions, it's really nice to be able to have them understand what a chloroplast is doing because they understand now the process. But also, you can demystify uh, mitochondria because you can show cellular respiration, which is the reaction going the other direction and liberating energy. But right now, we're going to focus on the main point of this talk, which is really using these um, models to teach about air. And air is a mixture, which is really nice. It gives a nice example of mixtures. Our first lesson, Understanding Air, uh, we begin by raising curiosity about what is in air. 
and these are samples that uh, I chose from my own students' misunderstandings and display them here. It's quite easy even for younger kids to look at the circle and see that this one is mostly nitrogen. This one down here, this option would be a lot of carbon dioxide and oxygen, and this one would be mostly oxygen. I used to um, survey my class by having them put their heads down on the desk, and then I would say, how many people like option A, and then they would raise their hand, and B and C, so the voting would be really very uh, personal, and you didn't have to worry about kids looking at what other kids were answering. So you would get a very good um, understanding of preconceptions before starting. So the answer was really a surprise to many kids, and this is a model that is a mat that we use for putting our Legos on. So you can see that eight out of the 10 uh, molecules here would be nitrogen, 80%. 20% oxygen, but what's really interesting is noticing that less than 1% is CO2, which is really an important point for kids when they're hearing so much about CO2. Also, at this point, we could move to looking at the fact that um, we are looking at carbon dioxide at so, such low levels, we probably need to use a different measurement system. So we use parts per million, and I can show you how this can relate to a lot of math that might be done at this age. So I really like to be able to use math in science class. And so down at the bottom of the screen, you can see how you can work with equivalent fractions, and your math teachers would be really delighted. Uh, but moving back now to looking at the numbers, uh, parts per million, uh, when this mat was produced, this CO2 level was 390 parts per million, 390. Uh, safe CO2 levels. Uh, have been established internationally as being 350 parts per million. And if you go online right now, you're welcome to, it turns out that um, the current parts per million for CO2, are you ready to guess? <laughs> it's 399 parts per million. So um, I think it's really a good point to be able to acquaint kids with these numbers and get a chance to see it. Uh, what amounts of carbon dioxide are in the air and how we measure them. So this understanding air lesson has uh, class notes. This slide here shows them, and this slide shows the teacher's guide, which has been put on the class notes. The red are, are hits and suggestions, and the blue are um, keys or answers. Oh, I just wanted to pause for a moment. I put this slide in because I didn't want to get too carried away with classroom work, and I wanted to point out that these LEGO activities are great standalone ones. And so we show you uh, samples from Science Family Days at the Boston Conference uh, in this February. And uh, you can see um, uh, graduate students and undergraduates participating. And these, this is what the kit is, looks like. It's a small kit here, and the mats are here in front. We also have used these in other events, uh, for instance, at the Cambridge Science Festival, which we do every year in partnership with the Harvard School of Public Health. And this event, uh, the last few years, has been held in the Cambridge Public Library. And then also these events work very well with just community uh, areas. So this one was done, that I have a picture of down here, is um, from a clean air fair, also with Harvard School of Public Health. The Legos are particularly inviting. Uh, you can just see how uh, I've just made a quick comparison here. Uh, they're familiar, exciting, and inspire confidence in students in approaching them. All right, so here is, here is the lesson that we would uh, have, be doing particularly to introduce um, why ca uh, carbon dioxide levels are increasing. So right here we have a mat, and we're going to start with the hydrocarbon. We've chosen propane as a simple one. Most kids are familiar with it from barbecue days. And we have, we're going to burn it with oxygen here. And actually, oh, I have learned recently that there are more vehicles on the road that are using propane. So what happens is we get the spark, which ends up uh, creating the uh, starting off the chemical reaction. 
And when you flip the mat over and you use exactly the same atoms, you just rearrange them, start with water, and then kids start to see that they're producing a lot of CO2 molecules. And this brings up the opportunity to talk about CO2 as a greenhouse gas. This lesson, which includes uh, the uh, uh, short media clips as well, have been uh, put together by WGBH and are now organized on PBS Learning Media. And so there are short videos that are three minutes long or so that explain more about uh, greenhouse gases if you'd like to have that done. And also provide some documents, famous documents, such as the um, uh, CO2 uh, recordings from the Mauna Loa Observatory. It's just a wonderful collection. I just put this in here because uh, I realized it was a fun use math and science, particularly for the um, older kids to look at the graph and just see this is CO2 levels and how much they're going up, but how someone could uh, make an argument if only using these points on the curve over five-year times to say, oh, look, the CO2 is, is not increasing. So if these graphs and other information, I think, have a wealth of detail that you could use in many different ways. Now we're moving to the lesson two in understanding air, where we're going to focus a bit more on, on air pollution itself. And uh, kids can see how this happens if you start with propane again, build your propane molecule, lay it on the mat, put the four oxygen molecules on the mat, and then react them. If you take your molecules, I'm sorry, your atoms, and put them together, you'll first produce water. And then you have a choice here. You can choose this box. Uh, some teams in the room might do this one, and other, ones might, other teams might do this one. You'll notice that this one not only is producing carbon dioxide, but also soot. Carbon might be stuck together. And down here you have, in the lower box, you have the uh, products including carbon monoxide. So this is quite a good time to talk about things that are bad for your health. And most kids, when they're faced with looking at soot and carbon monoxide and a deep breath over here, I'm sure that they will uh, provide you with lots of information about bad for your health. This mat is not a chemical reactions mat. It's actually uh, just a straight layout mat, which introduces a lot of new molecules. And so um, I'm going to just flip to the next one. This is the answer key. Uh, or you could use this side of the mat for younger uh, aged kids because it provides the colors and they don't have to look at the formulas to figure them out. So right now, this is wonderful. You can really help a lot of people who still have problems in trying to understand about ozone, that ozone can be this ozone layer up high that's protective and good for us, and yet we do have ozone being produced down here on the ground, and that is a really important uh, opportunity. You can uh, explain that. And also it introduces the molecules of sulfur dioxide, and you can see that they are spouting out here from this uh, coal-fired plant. A lot of nice opportunity to talk about that after it's been built. And also uh, intro introducing um, NO2 as well. This uh, mat was made for more advanced children, as you can see, and advanced adults, of course. So here we are, we can actually take our uh, atoms and molecules made from LEGO and uh, demonstrate any of these um, reactions. And these are not step-by-step -step guided. They're uh, just available for students to look at and to learn more from. These lesson plans I'd like to point out um, try very nicely with the air quality index. That's one of the reasons why I chose and got excited about making these lesson plans because I saw that the weather information was providing information on them, particularly about ozone levels, part particle pollution, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. So this is really an interactive. It's very nice. I'm sorry I can't illustrate it better here. But you can roll over these and see side effects. You can choose the level and see what, what here of, let's say, a particle pollution and see which, people's, uh, which people would be affected the most. So. Um, 
it's really a very nice summary. Lesson plans also include media clips. Um, this one I wanted to point out to you is an environmental justice topic. It's really wonderful. It's about this teen who uh, lives in Little Village, and she mapped the contaminants from a coal-fired electrical plant and onto, onto Google and, um, and was able to make more people aware of what was going on. And I just checked it out recently and discovered that uh, there is a story about these plants closing early. So I was really pleased to learn about that. We did some evaluations, and I'd like to provide you with these results. The evaluations were done on both classroom and informal settings on the air pollution uh, and air climate change lessons, which together we call understanding air. So the method was by using a, a, a Likert scale here and testing, uh, asking for uh, the scale was one to four. And we were looking at responses that had to do with enjoyment, reported self-learning, and increased interest. So the younger kids, this happened to be a little bit younger age, as you can see, and they really were superbly delighted about working with LEGOs to understand these, these concepts and asked a lot of questions. It wasn't just LEGO building. And uh, they also wanted to learn more. I'll show you the, on the next couple of slides what they said they learned from the activity. We also did this lesson in Revere, Massachusetts with 137 students eighth graders this time, and they also were very positive and um, also interested in learning more. So the open response questions, I would like to point out, I was really pleased that health was mentioned as uh, one of the things they learned, and molecules in air and combustion hold also very high in both responses. It was great to see them write out things that they had learned, so this was really um, a very rewarding um, evaluation to do. This is my uh, summary of the concepts. I think we could call them learning goals for these lessons on understanding air. And I thought I'd just make sure to put them in this presentation so you could see them. Lastly, uh, here are my credits, and I've got plenty. This has been wonderful to be working at different parts of different teams. And the atmospheric science advisors uh, at MIT were extremely helpful to us. This is our production team from our two centers. I also just put up the Mind and Hand website again in case you wanted to uh, write that down and have it. And then lastly, I would like to provide special thanks to the team at WGBH who um, decided that this uh, to do something besides media clips and include these uh, Lego plans, which really was fun to do, and also uh, to NIEHS, who has provided the, the backing and the funding for the, this collection. So I'd like to mention this, is a, this lesson on understanding air is just part of a very large collection of, of lessons, and you can find them now on uh, learning media, environmental, public health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. If you have any questions for Kathy, please use the GoToWebinar questions panel at this time. While we're waiting, I have one here. Kathy, what motivated or inspired you to shift gears and go back to school to get your Master's of Education and teach? You know, it's always a small story, and, and so I'll tell this little story. I, um, I volunteered. I volunteered in my son's fourth grade class, and I taught a lesson about, uh, about cells and the immune system. And I had puppets and all sorts of things, and I got such rave reviews from everybody. I had suddenly turned my head and said, this was really, really rewarding. So that made me uh, decide that I would um, go back to school. So I, I found that there was a good program at the Harvard School of uh, Education, graduate school. And uh, they had a group of other scientists there that were attending too. So it, it made a very um, congenial group, and I enjoyed that process very much too. Okay. Could you share a little bit more about the PBS website? Oh, I'd love to, yes. Um, so NIEHS actually funded a project where um, WGBH in Boston, they produced NOVA. They went and found a lot of pertinent clips that had to do with environmental health issues. For instance, um, 
I can remember very vividly, they have footage of uh, kids eating sandwiches being sprayed with DDT to show how safe it was. So there are all these things you can see about how our views have changed over time, but they're part of other, they're short clips. They're like three to five minutes long, and you can put them in in various places, and I think they, they add so much. And then they do have a complete lesson plan, if you'd like them, uh, on various topics. And I personally learned a lot of my own, uh, broadened my own view about environmental health by being a reviewer on these um, uh, lessons. So um, I, I recommend them highly. Great. Thank you, Kathy. We really appreciate that. We, we can hear your enthusiasm and do it <laughs> in our region and education, and we appreciate the efforts and all of your success and the work that you've done over the years. Thank you, too, for the recognition. Great. Thanks. At this time, I would like to introduce the next speaker for uh, the second presentation, Dr. Dina Markowitz. Uh, Dina is the director of the University of Rochester's Life Sciences Learning Center, and she is also a professor of environmental medicine at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, with a secondary appointment in the Center for Community Health. She has a broad background in pre-college science education with specific expertise in developing and evaluating science curriculum materials and directing teacher professional development initiatives. She has led numerous NIH-funded science education programs, including outreach and enrichment programs for secondary students and curriculum development programs on a wide variety of biomedical-related topics, such as environmental health, genetic testing, stem cells, neurobiology, kidney disease, drug abuse, and addiction. Dina, I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay. So I'm going to give everybody a brief overview of a huge project that we completed in 2007. It was a seven-year project to develop curriculum on various topics in environmental health sciences. Our project was called My Environment, My Health, My Choices, and it was funded by NIEHS through a grant called Environmental Health Science as an Integrative Context for Learning. So we developed uh, close to 20 different curriculum modules. Uh, four of the modules were developed by local Rochester area teachers on topics that were very closely in tune to the Rochester communities that they live or work in. And then we expanded the project to New York State biology and chemistry teachers that worked for an organization called the New York State Biology Chemistry Mentor Network. And these mentor teachers developed 14 lessons, and their charge was to develop lessons that weren't so tied to their community, but lessons that could be used by teachers throughout the country. So um, the teachers who developed the lessons were in charge of developing and piloting the lessons in their own classrooms. And then the lessons were posted on our website. The New York State mentor teachers were also charged with disseminating the lessons through workshops that they led to other teacher colleagues. And then our group, the University of Rochester, also led workshops on a national level to further disseminate these lessons. So the lessons are currently housed on our website at the University of Rochester's Life Sciences Learning Center. If you go to our website, which um, you'll see the URL here, you'll see down the left-hand side um, a whole list of things that the Life Sciences Learning Center offers. But if you want to actually locate the lessons, you'll go down to the resources section here. You click on that, and you'll open up this page, which shows you all the lessons. And you'll notice over here, it asks you to actually register for the lesson materials. So to register for the materials, all you need to do is provide your email address. That's really all we ask for. And we use your email so that we can track to see how many people have registered. And then once in a while, we may send you an email asking you to let us know exactly what lessons you may have downloaded or used in your classroom or in other outreach settings. So here's where you click on register for lesson materials. Once you register, it'll open up um, a, a different portion of the website, which you'll actually have access to all the lesson materials. All the handouts 
in Word, PDF, and HTML format, any PowerPoints that might go along with it, and any PowerPoints for students without answer keys that might go along with the lessons. Um, some of the lessons also have animations or graphics. There's a whole lot of stuff that's available on this website. So um, pretty much in the rest of my presentation here, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of a handful of lessons that you can access on this website. And there are lots more lessons that I won't have time to um, summarize, but if you go to the website, just shop around on it and gather the materials and use whatever you want. So Talks in the City is the first lesson that I'm going to summarize. Um, this was created by two teachers, Colleen Hagedorn and Judy Moffitt from South Glens Falls High School. This provides a very brief introduction to environmental health sciences. Um, what is environmental health? Why is it important? And some of the basic concepts of environmental health science. Uh, toxicity, exposure, dose response, risk benefits assessment. A lot of these topics come up again and again in the other lessons. So if your students are unfamiliar with some basic concepts in environmental health or toxicology, this might be the first lesson you might want to start with in the series of our various lesson units. So the lesson includes a whole lot of different short activities ranging from PowerPoint presentations, student note outlines, um, even what we call a springboard cartoon bingo activity to start everything off. So the various activities in this, um, there's think pair shares, there's reading articles on dihydrogen monoxide, there's extension activities, there's exercises on dose and concentration, and there's a brainstorm carousel activity on risks and benefits. All these activities um, feature very active student involvement. This is not a lecture-based um, lesson. It is various activities. Keep your students involved and active. The next um, lesson that I will summarize is called Home Sweet Home, The Mysterious Death of Janelle Williams. This was created by a chemistry teacher named Tracy Suggs from Vestal High School, also in New York State. Um, Home Sweet Home is an interrupted case study concerning the safe use of chemicals found in, or, uh, in and around the home site. So what students do is they are charged with investigating the toxicity of chemicals found in um, household cleaning products that may be found in your house or your student's house. Many houses all over have these products. Students are asked first to record information from household product labels. We actually give the teacher um, mock labels of um, various household products that are commonly found. Students uh, learn how to read the ingredients from these household products. Then students need to evaluate information from various household products labels that we provide them. Oops. Well, I guess that's the end of that lesson. Uh, going on to the next lesson, it's called What Well, well What Will We Drink? And this was created by um, biology teacher Diana Larrabee from Corcoran High School in Syracuse, New York. This lesson is a um, case study. Students read a uh, fictitious scenario about a um, home building company called Apple Tree Homes, and they're creating a water district and connecting it to the, waters, the town water supplies. And some of the town um, home, homeowners wells are actually getting very low, and the homeowners are getting concerned that this problem will get worse as the new section of the home uh, development um, actually goes up. So the task for the students in this case study is to use um, information that is provided in the public domain to find information on well water and the public water supply. They then need to prepare a presentation for Jim and Norma, the homeowners, to help them decide what they will drink. This um, lesson includes a hands-on lab activity on parts per million, parts per billion, and serial dilutions. Students learn about um, the concentration of a part per million 
and um, they learn how to make a solution with a part per million concentration, and then they learn what means parts per billion. Also, I need to add in the teacher information for all these activities, it um, has a setup list for all of the lab materials, where to purchase lab materials. Um, many of the lab materials that teachers have chosen to use are commonly available um, in supermarkets or drugstores such as Rite Aid and CVS. So they tried to make these activities very, very simple on um, teacher preparation. So the next activity I'll summarize is called the effects of environmental lead poisoning on human health. Um, Jim Buckley from Edwards Knox Central School District created this activity. It starts with a problem-based learning scenario called Trouble in the Country, which introduces students to a family affected by lead hazards in their home. Uh, this is a three-part PBL scenario. Uh, students go through all three parts, learning and exploring as they go along. They learn a little bit about um, testing blood um, for lead levels. There is then a PowerPoint presentation on uh, lead hazards in and around the home, and here's a couple of pictures from the PowerPoint. Students then go on to do a home lead assessment and it's designed to have students explore their own home environments for potential lead sources. Uh, Jim Buckley, the teacher who designed this activity, lives in a very, very rural area um, in the center of New York State with a lot of very old housing stock, um, some of which is um, in disrepair. So a lot of these students do live in or around homes with significant lead hazards. Students then do a lead wet lead web quest to explore the science of lead and lead poisoning. Um, this is a computer-based activity. Of course, uh, teachers who don't have computer access in their classrooms can certainly skip the web quest activity. Uh, the next lesson that we have on the series is called As the Scale Tips, um, Phthalates and Reproductive Health. This lesson was created by Sandy LaTurell. She teaches at um, our State University of New York in Plattsburgh. Um, she's a former um, biology teacher at the high school level, but she currently teaches um, introductory college biology in Plattsburgh, New York. Uh, this lesson starts out with um, a little bit of a graphic splash. Um, what do all these things have in common? Well, all these um, have phthalates or used to have phthalates. Um, baby toys currently don't have phthalates, but when this um, lesson was created, there were phthalates in some imported baby toys. Uh, students then do a word splash to introduce them to the topic of phthalates. Then uh, this lesson also includes a problem-based scenario, um, phthalates balancing risks and benefits. Um, the scenario introduces a politician faced with taking a position on the use of phthalates in his own community. This lesson includes a PowerPoint um, describing um, how to assess risks and benefits of phthalate use. So this is a nice lesson if teachers want to um, get into um, student understandings of um, analyzing risk benefits. Uh, then um, there is a media blitz, Dewey, Stella, Malign, and Howe is a legal team. Um, it's an advertising team that has been charged with preparing recommendations on what position the senator should take regarding phthalate use. So uh, students actually design a media campaign that can be used to sell the senator's position to potential voters. The next lesson in the series is called I Can't Hear You. Um, this lesson was created by Dave Kleehammer of Brockport High School, which is um, a suburb of Rochester, New York. The question posed in this lesson is, does the iPad generation risk permanent hearing loss, um, which is something that students really should be concerned about because uh, turning up the, their iPods or MP3 players earbuds into their ears can really um, seriously affect their hearing loss as they get older. 
so this lesson um, was written to increase students' awareness of hearing risks associated with noise pollution in general and MP3 players in particular. So the activities for students including a, a brainstorming session on potential sources of noise pollution and what are the potential health effects of noise pollution. iPods are banned. Uh, students are then introduced to a new Board of Education policy in a fictitious high school. Effective immediately, all MP3 style devices are banned from these schools in our district. Students are then posed with a challenge to develop a brief presentation explaining this policy to the incoming freshman class at their local high school. What are the health risks associated with MP3 players? Uh, what are some reasons why this ban is reasonable? And what are the safe use of MP3 players? Now we're going to switch gears a little from biology over to chemistry because we did have a handful of chemistry teacher mentors who created some of these lessons. So the next lesson is called It's Organic, How Can That Be Bad? And this was created by Bob Dayton, who's a coordinating mentor with our New York State Biology Chemistry Professional Development Network. So this lesson starts off with a scenario about a um, worker who has been injured in a workplace accident. Jack Hassel, who's the owner and operator of Newcastle Collision and Services, was rushed to the hospital. He was working with contractors who were expanding the service center at his automotive facility. And they saw him walking erratically. Then he stumbled and fell. And Mr. Castle has elevated levels of organic solvents. And Daylight Environmental Services of Potsdam, New York, has been hired to test the soil at the Newcastle construction site. So that's how this lesson starts out. This is a directed case study. Students are charged with investigating how Jack, was Jack Hassel exposed to organic solvents. And can organic solvents affect the human body? How can they? And where might you be exposed to toxic solvents? What levels are these solvents harmful or lethal? And if there's a ground um, solvent spill or leak on the ground, how can the soil and groundwater be cleaned up? Topics addressed in this lesson are organic chemistry, solvents, toxic exposure, site remediation, and molecular modeling. The next chemistry lesson that was created is called Oh Say Can You See CO or Carbon Monoxide. This was created by Paul Jeb, a chemistry teacher at Ticonderoga High School in New York. This is actually a really, really nice lesson because it brings English language arts into the chemistry curriculum, which is rarely done. So we we particularly loved seeing this lesson as it was developed. Um, students start out looking at a portrait of Edgar Allan Poe. And if you look at the portrait very carefully, the drooping right eyelid and mouth are symptomatic of carbon monoxide poisoning, which is one theory on how Edgar Allan Poe may have died. Students read um, a portion of a Poe poem, The Raven. And um, in reading this, you notice this starts off, once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. Well, weakness is a symptom of carbon monoxide poisoning. So students go on to look at various other symptoms that may be in um, Poe's writings. Students are then charged with doing internet research on the physical properties of carbon monoxide, the symptoms and sources of carbon monoxide poisoning. They learn about carbon, mon mono carbon monoxide detectors and the uses of carbon monoxide. Students then create posters, which are um, student posters. And here is just an example of what a poster looks like students' names on top, a graphic that helps convey the topic, and a poem that helps convey information about the topic. So this is a poem by Lewis Carroll that was designed by these two students, John and Ellen, in their poster. 
the next chemistry activity is an activity on radon. Um, students learn about um, radon and uh, the decay series of uranium. And Kevin LaVarnway, a chemistry teacher at Shreen Lake Central School, created this activity. Students learn about radon, where it comes from, that it comes from rocks beneath the soil in um, homes, and that a, it's a natural decay product of uranium. And they also learn that um, radon increases the risk of lung cancer. Uh, students learn about the problem of radon. Um, it's all over the place. Um, it may be located in their neighborhoods. And then students learn about radioactivity. They learn about alpha and beta particles, gamma radiation, and the danger to living tissues from um, high energy radiation and the decay um, of uranium to create um, radon-222. Our next chemistry activity is called the chemistry of alcohol. This was created by Tom Good, a chemistry teacher at Cooperstown High School. This starts out with a scenario called um, Bizarre Fatality in the Suburbs, and students read a fictitious article about a teenager who dies from drinking jungle juice made with windshield washer fluid instead of vodka. Students then go on a web quest um, to uh, discover um, why methanol is more toxic than ethanol. If methanol and ethanol are both metabolized into an aldehyde and then into organic acid, why then is methanol more toxic than ethanol? Students then do a molecular modeling activity where they use uh, molecular, molecular modeling kits that are uh, available in uh, chemistry labs to learn about the difference between ethanol and formic acid. They then create a, a fictitious school board presentation. Uh, they're given the uh, charge about their, their chemistry class has been asked to prepare a presentation on the chemical of alcohol, breathalyzers, and school policy to deter drinking for the next Board of Ed meeting. So they learn about breathalyzers, and they also learn a little bit about alcohol poisoning. Um, now we're going to jump back to chemistry, from chemistry back to biology and learn a little bit about bioassays. So Kathy Hayhill from Wanta High School created a uh, lesson on bioassay investigations with Daphnia. So in this lesson, students learn a little bit about dose response curves. They learn about what it means to be a toxicant. Uh, students learn about bioassay procedures, how you set up, how you do bioassay observations, and how uh, bioassay results are analyzed. They also learn about LD50 dose response curves. And this is actually a two-part uh, lab investigation. Uh, part one is an introduction to bioassays, and part two is the actual lab part of it. Uh, in the um, teacher guide to this lesson, there is a guided version of this lab activity, and then there's a more open-ended inquiry version of this lab activity. So both of these um, uh, lab activities are in the teacher materials for this lesson. Uh, now our next lesson here is called Cough, Cough, Wheeze, Wheeze. Uh, this was created by Barbara Hobart, who is one of our coordinating mentors in our biology, chemistry, professional development network. This is a problem-based learning activity, starting out with a scenario that introduces a family affected by asthma. Uh, this uh, problem-based learning activity develops student understanding about allergy, asthma, and the role of mold as an asthma trigger. And this ties into the um, respiratory and immune system units that um, most biology teachers are doing in their intro biology courses. Now, I know I've gone through these lessons very, very quickly. There are many more lessons on our website. Some of the other lessons that are available 
um, are these four lessons, asthma in the city, living downstream, killing killer rain, and danger seen and unseen. These four lessons were the ones created by our Rochester area teachers. So these are more extensive lesson modules, and they're really meant for more local dissemination. So if you choose any of these lessons, you may have to do some modification to these lessons to make them align more with your uh, local environmental health issues and any problems that you may be having um, in your local areas. Um, also, I want to draw your attention to another lesson module called Nanotechnology Benefits and Health Risks. This was created through a different grant mechanism um, from our Science Education Partnership Award, our SEPA grant. Um, this lesson module actually has, I believe, nine different um, lesson activities, and this was created in-house by our faculty at the University of Rochester's Life Sciences Learning Center. So I think that's um, all I have to discuss now. Uh, if you have any questions about our activities, um, I'd be glad to take questions now. Thank you, Dina. Once again, if you have questions, please uh, let us know. You can use the GoToWebinar question panel at this time. Dina, I do have one question for you. Why is it important to have hands-on STEM activities uh, and with kids and, and with teachers involved? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, all our activities are hands-on or minds-on. So we find that students learn best by doing. Um, so either doing in a hands-on laboratory setting or doing with manipulative models. So they don't really need a laboratory wet lab to, do, to learn by doing. So all of these activities have some sort of active involvement. Uh, we found that this is engaging to students. It's also engaging to teachers to see their students active. Okay. Well, I had one question. Uh, Mercy and I were wondering for the question on the iPods and hearing MP3s, uh, does it cause hearing loss? Uh, to tell you the truth, um, I don't have the data at hand, but I believe that the teacher who created the lesson did some background investigations and found that there is a correlation between um, having loud sounds going into your ears through the earbuds and potential hearing loss. Hmm, very interesting. Last call for a question for um, Dr. Dina Markowitz. Hearing none, we're going to move forward. Thank you, Dina. You're welcome. At this time, I would like to introduce the speaker for our third presentation, Dr. Uh, Mercy Aranda. Mercy earned a bachelor's degree in biology from Florida State University and a doctoral degree in biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of Miami. After graduate school, she joined the NIEHS DNA uh, Replication Fidelity Group as an ERTA postdoc fellow. She has been involved with basic research here at NIEHS and in her current position as a biologist, her focus on DNA uh, polymerases continues and expands towards studying genome-wide gene expression changes in response to um, altering RNA, meta, excuse me, metabolism, excuse me, metabolizing en enzymes. Recently, Mercy has expanded her teaching and mentoring experience by giving several lectures to students participating in the summer internship program undergraduate students from North Carolina Central University and high school science teachers from the environmental health perspective workshops. She enjoys volunteering and has been involved in several outreach projects with Durham, Orange, and Miami-Dade County Schools. And she's definitely participated in several activities that I've been involved in, of course, the Citizen School and some of the programs that we do here uh, with Durham Public Schools and my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta. And we really appreciate all the work that she's done. So I'm going to turn it over to Mercy. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you for all of the registrants uh, for joining us uh, for today's webinar. And I'm a bit humbled to follow Kathy and, and Dina after those great presentations. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to tell you about a collaboration between um, students at Lowe's Grove Middle School um, here in Durham, North Carolina, that were enrolled in a spring uh, 2012 last year citizen school program um, under um, uh, the umbrella of citizen schools and um, NIEHS. Uh, so the name of our program was uh, Healthy Lungs and uh, Happy Living. 
And our institute has recently unveiled a strategic plan uh, for the years of 2012 through 2017 uh, with a mission that aims to discover how the environment affects people in order to promote healthier lives. Within the plan, there are a number of themes uh, that are included, and that's on the top right of your um, picture here, uh, the slide. And so that includes um, basic uh, the research and uh, communications and engagement, uh, health disparities, and um, in addition to translational science and both uh, fundamental and exposure research. So within that, um, the number of themes to achieve this mission, we also have training and education. And um, as important to that, then there are a number of goals that are included promoting communication and collaboration. And so one important thing is to consider and to understand that NIEHS is really behind uh, scientists in the institute that want to reach out to the community. And so I've been very lucky to be a part of this program um, through the support of NIEHS and my advisor and, and supervisor, uh, Dr. Tom Kunkel. Um, and in addition to citizen schools, as um, Sharon just mentioned, there are a number of initiatives uh, that are specific to, to our institute dealing with environmental health sciences um, as an ability for us scientists to come out to the communi community and foster this um, engagement with, with our um, neighbors, if you will. Okay, so um, then here what I wanted to say is that this was possible really because of a number of um, individuals uh, that helped us to, to really make this happen. So it was a volunteer effort that benefited from financial support from um, Office of Science Education and Diversity, uh, and this office is directed by Dr. Erica Reed. Um, guidance was from Bono Sen, uh, who was at the time the Director of the Environmental Health Perspectives and currently Project Coordinator of Global Environmental um, Health. So. Uh, volunteers and represented uh, personnel from NIEHS, both from the Division of Intramural Research as well as the Division of Extramural Research. And also we had a professor from um, EPA, and that was really exciting because it gave the students an opportunity to um, have hands-on activity in terms of measuring air quality um, with a super cool car that, that uh, Gail brought from EPA. Um, in addition to our support from NIEHS, uh, also, of course, in the collaboration with citizen schools, as I mentioned. So what is uh, citizen schools? Uh, citizen schools is a nonprofit organization that partners with middle schools um, in the U.S. to expand the learning day for, for low-income students. So what they do is they try to connect low-income students to organizations that are specializing in academic enrichment. So they have programs for what they call apprenticeships that are taught by community volunteers um, with focus on developing academic and uh, social skills. So Citizen Schools has expanded down to 18 cities. They started out um, in, in Boston, and uh, these cities are throughout the nation, and they serve 31 program sites. Uh, Citizen Schools has served over 4,500 um, or has counted on 4,500 volunteers, uh, about 4,200 and 4,500 students. So it's really important what they've brought to the community. And what, um, what if you look at their website, and I've provided the URL link here on the lower right-hand side, according to citizen schools, students who have participated in one of their programs are 20% more likely to finish high school and that 80% of students are more likely to attend uh, college. And there are a couple points that I wanted to bring um, about because I think when all of us at NIHS uh, were on board and took on this challenge of putting together this uh, first time uh, of its kind program, there were a few things to consider. One is that over the last 10 years, there has been an increase in uh, positions in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics compared to non-STEM jobs. So STEM occupations are projected to grow by 17% uh, compared to 9.8% growth for other occupations. The problem is that we don't have enough students that are enrolled 
in these um, uh, sign or, or degrees that would you know require uh, and finish with a STEM education. So only three and a half percent of college students enter and graduate from baccalaureate programs in STEM fields. Uh, about 50 percent or more of the engineering uh, doctoral degrees that are awarded in the U.S. Uh, by engineering colleges are to foreign nationals. So what happens is with a lot of the students that we're training in these areas, many of them do not uh, stay in the U.S. Uh, also, it was interesting to see this fact um, that teenagers are really more interested in STEM careers simply by having teachers who really enjoy the subject and are very enthusiastic about um, these uh, areas, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which a lot of students always shy away from because they find them very difficult. But if you uh, are very enthusiastic about it, they seem to kind of get on board with that. And here is just to really, this was sort of astonishing to me when I saw this. This is data um, that really takes us through 2018. And so when you think about STEM careers, considering here in this pie chart here on the left, physical sciences, traditional engineering, math, and, and, and life sciences, um, the greatest percent is basically uh, computing. So 70% of all careers are expected to, to um, jobs to be in the area of computing. And so then they, they further break this down into uh, software engineering, other computing, um, areas, uh, analysis, so uh, you know, this makes sense, I guess, now with the whole genome sequencing era and bioinformatic training that this is a big deal. So a couple of friends of mine that are now looking for jobs after a postdoc were joking that they would go back to school and maybe consider computing. So uh, this is really an eye opener. And so now I'll tell you um, a little bit about um, our program. Um, and here what we wanted to do was to focus on lung health and, and the environment. And so the question that's posted here in this poster, we have how does the environment affect our lungs? Why do we need healthy lungs and how do the lungs work? And so here we have this poster which was sort of uh, um, something that we used during the hook, which is an activity where all the students sort of rotate through the different programs and they select or vote um, on which program they would like to participate during the citizen schools. And so here we have ozone versus oxygen, so sort of the good and the bad um, in this poster. And so really what, what our goal was during our program these uh, 10 weeks was, one, to get, excited, to get students very excited about science at an early age with the idea of sustaining a, a pipeline of, of future scientists um, involved in, in different STEM careers. Um, with healthy lungs and happy living, then, our goal was to provide an understanding um, of what the impact of our environment is on a very important organ, which is the, the lung. So the NIHS um, contribution, um, as well as from EPA, uh, consisted of a number of, of volunteers. Uh, and this is actually 20, we had about 20 volunteers, which is the biggest group that citizen schools um, has seen. Um, also, they said that it was one of the biggest, uh, greatest receptions that they've seen for, for a program, and they've been doing this for quite a while at Lowe's Grove Middle School. So um, we reached out to 18 students, and it's a 10 week program that was designed to bring science to the classroom using creative and um, hands-on activities, again, as I mentioned, to get students excited about math and science. And with the idea that perhaps uh, students would consider future careers in, in STEM areas. And one important thing about um, citizen schools was to really educate the students to understand better about health, environmental health sciences, their immediate environment, and that they would take this information back to their family and to their friends and therefore making them ambassadors. So what, we, what I'm showing you in this slide here then is really what we did 
um, during the first uh, four or five weeks. And what was really interesting is we started out the first day, um, and Sharon was involved with this uh, first lecture, is we asked them what a scientist looks like. And of course, you know, these are middle school students, so a lot of them were, you know, nerds and this kind of language and, you know, not very receptive. Um, but really by the end, when they got to wear a lab coat and the, and the goggles, just to sort of give them an idea of what a scientist looks like in their mind and then what we look like outside of this idea, um, they were more receptive to, to us coming into their, their school, if you will. We also took advantage um, and brought lab notebooks, so this is where they recorded their data and they had to keep their data for um, 10 weeks. Uh, we, we also talked about the respiratory system and we had a very um, uh, neat activity where we, bought, uh, we brought along uh, Erlenmeyer flasks with fetal red and, and had them do different activities, um, plus minus exercise, and there they were detecting oxygen and um, CO2 gases. We also covered um, lung function, um, the effects of air pollution um, on our lungs. And the second half, they actually had uh, the chance to build a mechanical lung model and to show the effects of smoke on lung health. Um, we also talked about respiratory diseases. Um, in particular, we covered um, asthma. And this was a very interesting situation, and I'll show you a picture of one of our students, Javel uh, Blake Anderson, who was very shy and was, it took a lot to get him uh, involved in every, um, every week, every lecture, you know, about 20 minutes of, of speaking with him. And he was very nervous about the last thing that they are responsible for doing, which is uh, the WOW event. And here they become the teachers and they teach us back the things that they learn during the apprenticeship, and they get to do this with great pride because they teach us, their parents, and their family um, and friends. So it's a big night for them, but he seems to uh, not do well under these conditions and kept telling me he didn't want to do this. So the idea was how could I get this student involved in this activity uh, without any stress? And it turns out that he's asthmatic. And so one day I just thought, well, what if I have him just talk about how it is living with asthma, and he actually took it upon himself uh, to tell the story uh, during that night where, you know, we had politicians coming out, the community, family, friends, uh, what it's like to live with asthma, and he did so well that he actually won an award for that. So that was a very proud moment for all the volunteers um, and for himself and his family. So here, at a glance, is what our, our module looked like for the 10 weeks. Um, as, as I mentioned, a couple of these already, uh, the different uh, topics, and this was an opportunity for us to actually develop the curriculum. We didn't have anything in place at NIEHS, so it was the um, teams coming together and then working together as a team to make sure that you have all the different lectures and that you have a nice transition from week one to week two, so on and so forth. Uh, so it was a lot of work on our part, but I think it was a great benefit to the, our students. Uh, so the first half I told you about what does a scientist look like. Um, another thing that they were very excited about is we a few of us brought our notebooks, science notebooks, and showed them what it looked like. So they were keeping their lab notebook. And we are, here we have Madison um, keeping her lab notebook, plotting her, her data. And then this data was used for an activity that I will tell you about shortly. Um, and then you can see the iPhone and the calculator there, of course, to calculate their averages. Um, so this was kind of um, very, just very, uh, I think, fun and exciting for them to see that they were doing something that, that we do pretty much, you know, every day. Here, uh, to talk about lung function and understanding the respiratory system, uh, the um, office, uh, Erica Reed's office, purchased an atomical lung model that's shown here in the middle. And this was available to the students every week. And so, you know, before class, after class, they would stay and, and kind of play around with the model and looking at the lungs and the heart. Um, and what you see on the left and right of this model are the um, lung models that the students built. And this was interesting um, and a lot of fun for the students. We had a 
different groups and some groups did it in 10 minutes and other groups took a little bit longer, but once they had it completed, it was exciting. Um, and they got then to put in like coffee grounds uh, to see if you have some sort of, you know, uh, uh, let's say pollutant or of course this is not really real, but to give them an idea of what happens when you have something in this balloon that represents each of the lobes of the lungs, what happens also the effects of smoke. Um, so this was really a hands-on way to kind of see what happens um, with, um, with their lung function. Here, uh, another activity that we included every week at the beginning of the class was to measure their lung capacity. And so we have here, uh, basically, the way we made this was with a trash can. We fill it with water. We have another um, container. We invert it. And then there, with the, uh, they blow air into this. And the, um, the number of cups that are displaced are marked on the side of the inside um, container. And they uh, then took note of this data. Uh, so they did this activity without exercise, with exercise, and they recorded this data, and then we had to, they have to explain to us why they, they saw these differences in the number of cup, the cups that were displaced when they measured their lung capacity. So this was something they did every week, and as I mentioned, this is the data that they reported. And in this activity here, um, this was one of the activities already at, at week eight. And so what they had to do here was to look um, at their notebook. They used um, four to five data points from their table. And using um, uh, Century 21st uh, skills as per uh, citizen school's requirement, uh, they, we looked at different things like, uh, uh, you know, analyzing the data, what, uh, what is an average, calculate your average, and now we're going to graph this data. Uh, number of cups displaced for girls versus um, boys, and then if there were any things that they noticed, any observations that they made on their data, did the boys displace a greater number of cups versus the girls, and if so, why did they think that was happening? So do you observe any patterns? Why do you see these trends? Give them an example of a trend, um, and really drawing conclusions. And so this was sort of an eye-opener for many of the volunteers because we're dealing with middle school students that are 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. And uh, for this activity on this day, none of the 6th graders could graph uh, the data. And so this was some activity that we gave an amount of time and really took us much longer with the 6th graders to, to complete it, and we did. Uh, but it just shows us that a lot of the stuff that we read um, and that we come across is that we're not ranked very highly in, in math literacy or science literacy, and this was really for us one of the first things that, that came to us in, in week eight. Um, and so we spent more time with those students that we saw were struggling. We stayed with them a little bit longer to help them out. Um, so this was something very exciting with them, and one thing that I mentioned to them is that, you know, a lot of the students, oh, I, we, I don't like math, but I tell them that math is around them, you know, do you like to play video games? And so, of course, all of them raised their hand, and so I said, well, what you're doing there with those games is it took this much of science and, you know, computing and computer science and writing programs and to do this and, you know, how many of you would like to do this? And we actually had a couple of students that thought, oh, this is really cool. And so I think it's really bringing awareness to students that it's not just a, an equation on a piece of paper, but that in thinking in terms of how these activities are really around us every day. Here I'm, I'm just finishing up with um, pictures for, that were taken on May uh, 2012, and this is, I mentioned, this is the WOW uh, event. And now this is the opportunity for the young apprentices to become the teacher and teach us and teach their uh, parents and their friends uh, what they learned during these 10 weeks. And it inspires a, a confidence. You want to teach them not just the skills um, for STEM, but also social skills. That's part of the Citizen Schools program. And it gives an opportunity for public speaking. So here we have on the left most, we have uh, the model um, here with the model and the model that they built for the lung. 
Here we have the lung capacity team. Here's the phenol red, and here's Javal. This is the student who I told you about who was completely shy, and then that night just was shining and did amazingly well. And here, what, this, what it meant for, for the students was the ability to interact with students who were literally around the um, corner from them. Uh, NIEHS is, is very nearby, so it gives us a great opportunity to come to Lowe's Grove uh, Middle School to increase uh, each of the students' understanding of what a scientist does, how the environment impacts their health, an opportunity for each student to teach their family and friends what they've learned, to work in a team um, uh, setting as well as uh, uh, develop effective oral presentation skills. Uh, for us, it was, of course, important to reach and teach students to young minds. Uh, it gave us an opportunity to do something that we love, uh, to improve relations with our community and to foster commitment with our community, as well as developing curriculum and improving um, uh, planning skills. Um, so here is the last slide, and um, all the people who made this possible, of course, all of our students at Lowe's Grove Middle School, um, our amazing citizen schools teacher, Sarah Rabiner, um, our Office of Science, Education, and Diversity, headed by Dr. Reed, uh, Bono Sen, um, the project co-leader who without, um, I could not have done um, all of this, Nisha Cavanaugh, and all of our great volunteers here in the last bullet. And, um, we're proud to say that this program uh, happened again this spring in 2013, and Erica's office continues to lead this and now are considering another program for, um, for the fall. And I'd like to thank you for your um, time, and I take any questions at this moment. Thank you, Mercy, for your presentation. Are there any qu questions for her? I do have one question. How difficult was it to organize all of these volunteers and develop this curriculum? This was very difficult uh, because everybody, you know, at NIEHS were very busy uh, with your basic research and that's your first priority. Uh, but it was very difficult to get all of these 20 volunteers sort of on the same page and to get the curriculum to sort of flow. Everybody, you know, groups were broken into smaller groups and then those groups sort of came together. We had a leader in each group and so it was, it was a lot of work but a, a lot of fun. So we're opening up now for, uh, I think, questions for everybody. Um, if you have questions for any of our speakers, uh, Kathy, Mercy, or Dina, please uh, let us know, and we will um, start the question and answer session. While we're waiting for questions to come in, maybe, Kathy, you can answer the question from earlier about the, um, the, the kits and how to get access to it and what your program will provide. Certainly. Okay. Um, this is Kathy. Uh, I would just like to remark, first of all, that we put all the teaching materials, including the, uh, the instructions and everything online. And so you could put together a kit yourself if you got your Lego uh, bricks together. So I'd just like to point out that's a, a good alternative if that's the way you'd like to do it. And then we uh, are trying to make uh, available to schools these materials at our cost. And so we do have a spot on, your, on our website where people can inquire about it. Um, I actually was curious whether um, Mercy, uh, can I ask a question? <laughs> Is that okay? Go ahead. Uh, Mercy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm just curious if, uh, she, if her gather their materials to be available to other people. So um, I know it's a big step doing it yourself getting getting practice with it and then going the other step to make it so that you can hand it off to other people. So I was just curious if they're interested in doing that in the long run. So actually um, in one of the slides I included a link uh, to the citizen schools uh, and on their website they've already put our curriculum oh, uh, cool. okay. online and so it's on one of the slides so if you go to the uh, citizen schools website and you punch uh, or type in happy, uh, uh, happy Lungs, Healthy Living, uh, you'll see a curriculum for each of our uh, weeks. Okay. 
There was a question for you, Mercy, on um, the citizen schools. Is that available for high school students, do you know? Um, that I know it's mostly for earlier um, students and the idea being that you want to reach to uh, students at an earlier age and there I'm not sure about high school um, that's something that I can actually check um, I think the idea was that really reaching younger students and second that there weren't really a lot of volunteers um, or uh, funding to start these in, in high schools okay and there's one other question about citizen schools. People wanted to know how could they get involved in citizen schools. So if you go to the citizen schools um, webpage, they actually have uh, different links. If you if you would like to volunteer, and you can actually click and you can check whether there are schools in your region um, that you can volunteer and you know become a citizen um, teacher. And there are many opportunities. I know here there are several schools. I know that in Charlotte there are several opportunities. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all that information is on their website. Is there a link there that talks about how to nominate a school for citizens school participation? Do you know? I don't know. So we'll we'll check into that and we'll put an answer out. So we'll let everybody know about that. Let's check and see if we have any other questions here. I think that's all the questions that we saw here from Citizen School. Did anybody have any other questions about uh, STEM uh, from any of the programs, um, uh, Dina from University of Rochester or Kathy from MIT? If not, I'm going to ask any of our, our speakers if they have any parting words or anything they want to share. I think one of the most important things about the, the webinar series that we do here at NIEHS for the Partnerships for Environmental Public Health is to show best practices, to show different ways of approaching different uh, areas of, of research and science and education and having the opportunity to really have some dynamic speakers uh, like Mercy and Dina and Kathy share about what they've been doing in their individual programs and careers is important and it also helps us to really showcase some of this great work going on across the country. So uh, Kathy, any parting words? No, just thank you very much. I really enjoy learning a lot from other uh, presenters and um, I hope that our audience did too. Okay. Dina? Likewise, thank you very much for allowing me to present these materials and I hope teachers will find them useful. Great. Mercy? Likewise, I, I'm very humbled, as I mentioned, uh, to have been um, included in, in this series uh, with Kathy and Dina, and thank you for the opportunity, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know. Okay. We had one more question just popped up here. It says, are there any grants to visit the, is it that the Heaviston Center to do any of these activities um, there? I think this might be for uh, Kathy. Oh, the Edgerton Center. I'm sorry. Um, uh, the Edgerton Center uh, has, uh, has teaches groups practically every single day of the year, so um, you can the the website will sh uh, let you know if you check it out, and um, and the calendar is there as well, and the the, the lessons and uh, welcome. So and the, at no charge as well. So I I I guess I could mention that too. Okay. So uh, thank you. All right, and there are other opportunities, especially here in Durham. Uh, we actually partner with the, the North Carolina Biotechnology uh, Center to actually do teacher uh, education programs here at NIEHS. So twice a year, we do teacher workshops dealing with different topics from the environment and your health, uh, chemicals in the environment, other types of lessons that are done by uh, scientists here at NIEHS and teachers from all over the state get a chance to come here and uh, participate in those sessions and then also be able to uh, visit uh, the lab and, and, and get a, acclimate themselves to NIEHS and the work that we do here. So that's an opportunity also for teachers to participate and this program is co-sponsored of course by um, NIEHS and, uh, and each year those students, the teachers get um, you know, a free ride to come and participate in the workshop. So thank you for participating in today's sessions. Before we close, I would like to make a few announcements. Your feedback is important. After today's webinar, please take a moment to fill out the short evaluation form. Your feedback is vital to helping us ensure that we're providing the highest quality speakers and information to meet your needs. 
And please keep in touch with PEPH uh, with our listserv and our PEPH newsletter. You can sign up by emailing PEPH at NIEHS dot NIH dot gov. Uh, that information is on your on this slide here. And we encourage you to sign up for that. You'll get information about all the activities uh, that all of our grantees and, and uh, other programs are involved with, dealing with uh, our network of partnerships for environmental public health and any workshop or any announcement for grants or funding is also available there. And we, we send that um, um, information to the listserv on a regular basis. We do also have upcoming webinars. Our next webinar will be Environmental Justice for Native Americans on August the 21st. More information about those upcoming web webinars as well as registration links will be on the PPH events page uh, as soon as they're available. The link to the events page is shown here on this slide. Thanks once again to our presenters, uh, Dr. Um, Kathy. Uh, Vanderier, Dr. Dina Markowitz, and Dr. Mercedes Aranda. We really appreciate what you've done uh, with these programs, and thank you for sharing highlights of, of these activities. That concludes our today, uh, today's webinar. Thank you for participating. <laughs>